Hello, Psyche community, and welcome to today's webinar, Neuropsychiatric Symptoms and Alzheimer's Disease, a focus on agitation. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Archuleta, and I am a medical science liaison for Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization, Inc. I will serve as the moderator for today's discussion featuring Dr. Jeffrey Cummings and Dr. George Grossberg. This presentation is sponsored by Otsuka and Lumbeck, and our speakers are paid consultants for Otsuka Pharmaceutical and Commercialization, Inc. I think there's a there's a lot of interaction between the neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, we find that our patients who are agitated are usually irritable. Uh, we know that patients with psychosis can become agitated. So there's a great interplay between these uh, these different aspects of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that result in agitation. And of course, several of them can occur either conjointly or in the same individual during various times during the disease. So it makes it a bit more daunting, <laughs> there's no doubt. Let me talk a little bit about this uh, issue and not just the ethnic and racial, but also I think the, the spiritual and uh, religious kind of considerations. Uh, very, very important, I think, to keep these things in mind relative to not just agitation, but the spectrum of behavioral symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. And I wanted to share, Jeff, with you uh, a patient that I have currently uh, who came to see me with Alzheimer's disease, already previously worked up and diagnosed, but primarily with agitation, especially during the early parts of the day, in the afternoon as well. The family was, was quite perplexed. They didn't know what to do and they didn't know how to deal, about, deal with it. And in getting more information and more history, I found out that the, the patient was a gentleman in his 80s, throughout his whole life, was a very, very religious Jewish person, an Orthodox Jewish individual. That for many, many decades, every morning, he would go to synagogue uh, for prayers, he would put on the tefillin, the phylacteries, and that was a big, big part of his routine. And I asked the family, you know, is he still going to the synagogue? Are you taking him to the synagogue? And they said, no, we, we stopped taking him because he no longer can read. He can't read English, much less read the Hebrew text in the prayer book. And I said to them, I said, well, maybe even though he can't read, it may not be a bad idea to take him in the morning, which he had been going for so many years every morning to the synagogue, to give him the prayer book, help him with the phylacteries, because that routine, that important part of his religious life may have a beneficial effect on his behavior. And they started doing that, and guess what? It made a tremendous difference. He didn't know which part of the book was up or down. He didn't know how to read. He had difficulty following, but just the significance of the ritual that he had been part of for so many part, years of his life made a huge difference in his behavior. And the family was very, very thankful. Just reminds us how important the ethnic and racial, cultural and spiritual religious considerations need to be uh, in neuropsychiatric symptoms. Well, that's a, that's a great example, George. Uh, and I think that idea of familiarity is so important and so reassuring to people. So when they're taken out of those circumstances or the rituals that they've had before, it can be very distressing. And there's, you know, there's more and more study now of the uh, racial and ethnic uh, relationships to agitation. We can see that Hispanic individuals and African-Americans tend to have higher rates of agitation. We're not sure where that's coming from, whether that's a stress level or an expression of, of concern. Uh, but uh, we are, I think, uh, sensitizing ourselves and our institutions uh, to be much more sensitive to the uh, cultural, religious, spiritual, uh, ethnic, and racial dimensions of neuropsychiatric care. With the International Psychogeriatric Association, we led several years ago and published in 2015 uh, the criteria for uh, the diagnosis of agitation in patients with cognitive impairment. Uh, and these criteria have worked very well. I'm very proud of them. They've made it into the literature. Many kinds of studies have used them. Uh, they've been used in more than a dozen clinical trials at this point, so they really have helped uh, to have a vocabulary with which to describe patients. Uh, so as you can see there, uh, they require that there be one of three behaviors, either excessive uh, motor activity, verbal aggression, or physical aggression, 
uh, they have to have had that recurring over the la at least the last two weeks, uh, and it must be distressing. It can be mild, moderate, or severe in intensity. And these guidelines have functioned very well in terms of both clinical applications where clinicians need guidance to know how these uh, adjectives work in terms of identifying patients, and then also in research settings where they serve to define patients for clinical trials and other types of research. Yeah, I think, uh, Jeff, thank you for leading this effort. I think it's been a great advance for the field. And like you pointed out, not just in our kind of more consistent understanding and defining of clinical symptomatology, in this case, agitation, but also as far as uh, research application. So uh, that's been very, very helpful. This is actually um, uh, related, I guess, in many ways to looking at uh, agitation and having a clear definition for agitation. Uh, actually, a large study uh, that looked at patients with probable or diagnosed Alzheimer's disease or dementia uh, and looked at what percentage of this total population of dementia patients uh, had agitation noted in their electronic health records. And as you can see, quite a significant proportion, almost 45%, you know, had agitation noted somewhere in the electronic health record. However, as we see on the right part of the graphic, in individuals where they actually also had staging for Alzheimer's disease severity, we see an even higher, an even higher percentage within the electronic health records. What's also interesting, as we're gonna see in the pop-up here in the middle, is that even though the electronic health records seem to reflect the true high prevalence of agitation in this patient population, as far as using a diagnosis code specifically for agitation, it was seen in less than 5% of medical records. Uh, so that obviously you know, highly suggests to me uh, that uh, agitation as a symptom may be significantly underrepresented. What are your thoughts, Jeff? Well, I think that's exactly right. Uh, we often think of the, the electronic medical record as a source of information that we could go to to understand the population. And I think the more we look at them, the more we see that doctors tend not to make a diagnosis of dementia. They certainly don't make specific diagnoses within that. For example, Alzheimer's disease, and they don't use uh, the usual diagnostic codes uh, for the behavioral, uh, behavioral changes that are seen in these patients. So I think overall, the electronic medical record may vastly underrepresent the actual prevalence of dementia as well as the behavioral disturbances within dementia. So related to this, and I think this is something that maybe many clinicians and of course many families and professional caregivers don't fully understand because I know that many of us, when we think about agitation or even overtly aggressive kinds of behaviors in a condition like Alzheimer's disease, we're thinking, well, you know, you don't see that until the very later or the more advanced stages. But I think as we see in this study, a large study, almost 80,000 Alzheimer's patients in the community, again, it's based on electronic health records, but nonetheless, I think the take home point for me is, is that we need to look at the kind of spectrum of agitation from irritability to agitation to overtly aggressive behaviors as being potentially present throughout the course of Alzheimer's disease. We see it even in prodromal Alzheimer's. We see it in the mild cases, the moderate, and then of course it does tend to become a bit more prevalent later on. Now, a couple of things come to mind for me, George. One is that agitation is common across all phases of Alzheimer's disease, but the character may differ. Uh, so that MCI patients, for example, may have short periods of agitation where they are irritable or lose control of their temper, that sort of thing. Whereas in the more severe stages, of course, it's more prolonged, more persistent, more severe, more disruptive. Uh, so agitation is present across the entire spectrum, but it, but it differs somewhat uh, according to the severity of the dementia. The other thing that uh, I'd like to point out is that Patients with MCI have a whole variety of disorders. It's a non-specific uh, identification syndrome. However, when one has MCI 
and a behavioral disturbance, that patient is very likely to progress and is far more likely to have Alzheimer's disease as the underlying etiology than a patient who has MCI without any concomitant behavioral changes.